in history. Over 70 million men and women served in the armed forces on both sides. Truly a global war. 57 nations fought in Europe, Asia, Africa, and throughout the many islands in all of the oceans of the world. For America, it began and ended as an air war. But between the attack on Pearl Harbor and the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki, many would die in the air, on land, and sea. This is the story of the primary American warbirds that took the battle to Germany and Japan. It is a powerful and awe-inspiring account. Awesome because the United States went from a second-rate air fleet to history's largest air force in less than five years. Production of military aircraft in the United States went from 1,800 planes in 1938 to just under 100,000 in 1944. It was only possible because the entire nation willed it to be so. When the United States first entered the war, it was clear to Allied commanders that it would be necessary to establish supremacy of the sky in order to provide air support for any land war. No strategic air campaign could be launched without an effective long-range bomber. And, as luck would have it, there was already an amazing aircraft that could soar through the air, a fortress on wings filled with guns, bullets, and bombs. In World War II, it led the way to victory. It was not the best bomber. It could not fly the farthest or the highest or hold the most bombs. But it was there when it was needed and performed above and beyond the expectations of many. For those who flew her, she was a magnificent machine. She was called the B-17 Flying Fortress. B-17's hallmark was typically Boeing. It was an extremely rugged airplane. Uh, it was a simple airplane. It went together very well. It was easily maintained in service. Uh, it had very fine handling qualities, very fine flying characteristics. It was, it was regarded at the time and has certainly been regarded since with genuine affection. B-17 people very much liked their airplane. The B-17 had a 103-foot wingspan with a total length of just over 74 feet. Its height was 19 feet, one inch. It was powered by four Wright R1820 engines, and it had a maximum speed of 300 miles per hour. It weighed 37,700 pounds empty and 55,500 pounds loaded for battle. With a ceiling of 35,000 feet, and a range of just over 1,800 miles, it carried the war to Germany and the Nazis never recovered. It was loved by its 10-member crews because it was known for bringing them home, even with a great deal of battle damage. It was a very survivable airplane. Now, having said that, uh, there were tremendous numbers of B-17s lost in combat, and there were tremendous numbers of B-17 crewmen who were lost in combat. But if you take a look at bombers across the nations in World War II, I think we could say that prior to the B-29, the B-17 was the most survivable combat bomber that any nation fielded into combat service. The, for example, the escape rates of crewmen from the B-17 compared to the escape rates of crewmen from other bombers, particularly from British bombers, uh, was extraordinarily high. Uh, this was, in fact, because the airplane would hold together well, 
uh, so that it may take severe combat damage but would hold together long enough for the crew to escape from it, uh, as well as the fact that it was an open airplane. It had a lot of areas in which you could leap from the airplane safely. It had doors, it had ports, uh, you could go out straight from the bomb bay, it had hatches here, there, and everywhere. So this, this made the airplane regarded with genuine affection. Uh, it was capable of undertaking multiple tasks. Uh, B-17s were flown in the electronic warfare role. Uh, they were used for agent insertion in what we term today special operations missions in terms of inserting uh, sabotage teams or supplying sabotage teams in the ground or guerrilla forces. It was used for strategic bombing. There was even an attempt in the, in the uh, Second World War, two attempts in the Second World War to make uh, uh, special use of B-17s. In one case, take war weary B-17s and turn them into guided missiles. Uh, and in the other case, to take B-17s and use them as launch platforms for uh, a development of the German V-1 called the Republic Loon, the JB-2 Loon, which would have been a pulse jet uh, air-launched air-to-surface missile, although with refined guidance technology so that it was really far more precise than the German V-1. The history of the B-17 is the history of American know-how. Before the war, in June 1934, the Boeing Company received a contract from the Army for design data, a full-scale wooden mock-up and complete wind tunnel tests on their proposal for a long-range bomber. Building the first four-engine bomber was a great gamble. No one would have thought that this maze of metal taking shape in the Boeing plant was to become one of the major weapons in the fight for freedom a few years later. In June of 1935, the first model rolled out into the sun. She looked magnificent. So good, they called her a flying fortress, and the name stuck. If she worked, the XB-17 would be the biggest single step toward advancement of American air power in history. But it still wasn't clear if the Army Air Corps would accept the design. The plane was groomed and readied for a back-breaking test. At Seattle, the XB-17 pointed its sharp nose to the east and with a great surge of power, soared into the air. The bomber flew the record-shattering 2,100 miles non-stop in exactly nine hours at an average speed of 232 miles per hour. The basic Air Corps specifications were met as the plane came to rest at Wright Field in Ohio. For two months, Air Corps engineers tested the B-17. Few other planes were equally important in air history. Then came the day of the big test, October 30th, 1935, and before the very eyes of the Army brass who had come to decide on it, high hopes were shaken. Everyone who worked long and hard on this new weapon saw the prototype go up in smoke. But Air Corps Chief General Westover immediately took up the battle. After several months of investigation, the plane was cleared of any mechanical fault. The B-17 could not be ignored because of an accident. The contract for construction of a service test fleet of 13 airplanes had been awarded the Boeing Company by the leaders of the Air Corps. They claimed the airplane had brought into being a different mode of warfare, the application of air power. And with a B-17, they hoped to give America the weapon which could engage the enemy on land, sea, and in the air, destroy his war production, and will to fight. The Air Corps was finally being equipped with weapons equal to any military plane anywhere in design, speed, and endurance. By the time the United States got into the war, in December 1941, courtesy of Japan's assault on Pearl Harbor, we found a situation that from 1942 onwards, when American forces arrived in Europe, 
that we were able, really, in the 1942 and early 1943 time period, to get up to speed, to learn lessons from the British who had been fighting the Germans for quite a while, to refine our fighter tactics and our employment strategy, and then to put our bomber force into operation. Now, this should not be construed to mean that things went very, very smoothly, because they did not. We had very serious difficulties in 1943 getting our strategic bomber operations underway. And this was because our bombing philosophy was very different than the British. Now, this does not mean that, that it was inferior to the British. I think far from it. I think we had a better approach, basically, that we took than the British in, in terms of what we were trying to uh, achieve with our strategic bomber offensive. But it meant that the lessons that they had learned were not directly applicable to our experience. One lesson they had learned was, of course, the problems of operating bombers on long, deep, unescorted missions in the face of intense fighter opposition. Now, we were committed to do daylight bombing. But rather than wait to the point where we had decent, long-range fighter escort that could get us to a target and back completely protected, we decided in the summer of 1943 to begin a series of assaults against the, the increasingly deep targets, strategic targets, in Germany and occupied Europe. We had begun these actually in 1942, but they really built up speed in 1943. In June of 1942, men of the 8th Air Force left New York 10,000 strong aboard a luxury liner for England to test their theory of long-range bombing. On her maiden troop ship run across the Atlantic, the Queen Elizabeth carried the vanguard of American air power for the new fight against aggression. The B-17 would lead the way. In England, at High Wycombe Field, the Allies used a girls' boarding school as headquarters. Here, 30 miles from Piccadilly, began a build-up which eventually made the 8th Air Force larger than the entire U.S. Army had been only three years before. As the summer of 1942 rushed by, the work of the entire Army Air Force was committed to using the B-17 as its principal long-range bomber. The Allies learned about the air war from the Royal Air Force, which had been fighting a lonely battle against the Nazis. There soon developed a disagreement over tactics. The Army Air Force came prepared for daylight precision bombing but the British practiced only night area bombing, having suffered heavy losses in daylight operations. The British Bomber Command picked their targets, trained their crews, fed them lots of carrots, and designed their planes for deadly night attacks. The success of the Wellingtons and Lancasters in attacks against Cologne and the Ruhr during the summer nights of 1942 offered grim evidence of what such tactics could accomplish. But the Americans wanted to see what their flying fortress could do during the day. The B-17's first test in tactics came August 17th. It was a critical day for the 8th Bomber Command when the Allies loaded up for the first U.S. raid from England in U.S. planes in daylight. General Ira Aker had told the B-17 pilots that the target was the great marshalling yard near Rouen, in Nazi-occupied France. There were still plenty of skeptics who predicted dismal results from the first attempt at a daylight mission. Generals Spots and Aker had to prove them wrong. The Allies were fully aware of the long-range strategic planning that hinged on this particular mission. Maybe they didn't know any better, but the Allies had plenty of confidence. Confidence in their weapons, confidence in their soldiers and the way they did their job. The Allies didn't think of themselves as heroes, just here to do a job. But heroes or not, the flying privates, sergeants, and generals were putting their lives on the line and in the hands of the B-17. At the controls of one of the lead ships was General Akers himself, flying a B-17 which someone aptly named Yankee Doodle. As the B-17s pulled up their gear, American flyers assembled over the British countryside, ready to test an American idea in France. High altitude, 
precision bombing. As England disappeared behind the B-17s, the crews took up battle stations. The bombardiers and gunners knew that the fate of the mission and the lives of the crew depended on them. The crews took turns manning the guns, inspecting positions. German warning centers, caught by surprise, didn't report the fortresses until they were well on their way to the target. The Allies made a direct run for a point about three miles north of Rouen, and then a slight turn to the right for the bombing approach. The crew members, especially the gunners, wondered why the sky was clear of German fighters. Visibility was excellent, something you don't get when night bombing. All 12 planes dropped a total of 37,000 pounds of bombs. Then the Allies met flat. Daylight made them better targets, too. The Nazis pumped anti-aircraft shells right up to the B-17's altitude. Two of the fortresses collected some flak. Then, 40 German fighters joined the fight. When the Allies finally shook off the enemy attack, the group was intact. The mission was far more successful than many had hoped. Even British Bomber Command Air Chief Marshal Harris sent General Aker enthusiastic congratulations. Yankee Doodle, he said, certainly went to town and can stick another well-deserved feather in his cap. The B-17 continued to play a major role in the strategic offensive against Germany. In the early hours of August 17, 1943, Another great episode unfolded in the history of the Flying Fortress. On the first anniversary of their operations against Fortress Europe, eight bomber commands prepared 376 B-17s for the two most critical targets on their list, the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt aircraft factory at Regensburg, both deep in Germany. What an anniversary. Just a year ago, the Allies flew that first mission to Rouen, 12 B-17s flying 56 miles to the target. Now, the Allies were taking 376 fortresses 500 miles into Germany. Never had the Allies prepared for so rough a mission. In 1943, the AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe had already reached its peak. By the time the Allies returned from this air battle, it was well understood that the cost, in terms of casualties, would be on a large scale, and costly both to crews and ships. Getting into the trucks, the Allies didn't dream that August 17th was being written into air history. This day, a double mission involving the deepest penetration ever attempted in Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. The B-17 had an appointment with destiny. The Allies knew that as they went further into Germany, they would hurt the Axis powers more. But B-17 crews also knew they'd have to pay a higher price for admission. And now, the last briefing as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Individuals no longer existed. The Allies were now 10-man teams, and their teamwork would determine success, and perhaps their lives. Action against Schweinfurt got underway. Regensburg task forces had just hit their target. 
a vast and intricate machine of destruction had been set in motion. Behind these B-17s were weeks of high command planning. Now, crewmen took care of routine duties. Ahead of them were four hours of rugged action. So far, these B-17 bombers had never been stopped. Although German defenses had stiffened, American formations had not been prevented from reaching their objectives once they responded to a green takeoff signal. As always, each thundering run was an epoch of suspense until 30 tons of bombs, plane, and men were lifted from the earth. The leader of the first B-17 wing swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. The sky quickly filled with stately fortresses flying through space. But as soon as they got into formation over the British field, they were picked up by German radar. Across the channel, the tentacles of the enemy's locator system, having touched the flying fortresses, now pinpointed them in space. Luftwaffe experts accurately plotted the course, altitude, and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, at dozens of Nazi airfields from as far north as Denmark to down around Paris, German fighter units began to send up everything they had. Their order was, intercept and destroy the oncoming B-17 fortresses. The answer to the increasing Allied bomber offensive was this stepped-up German fighter strength. Waves of opposition screamed off the map of Europe. In spite of the Luftwaffe, Allied planners selected these targets according to Allied Air Force priority. That's why, nearly three hours after the 4th Bomber Group had paralyzed the Nazis' Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, the Allies in the 1st Bomb Wing were on their way to strike Schweinfurt. In the face of an aroused enemy, as the B-17 crews began to run into flak, their gunners could feel the entire German Air Force warming up. Strict radio silence was maintained while trained eyes searched the sky. The Luftwaffe unleashed every trick. The B-17s suffered the most savage blows since the war began. Although the Germans knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the road to Schweinfurt, the Allies never broke formation. Despite the ferocity of the attack, which extended all the way to and from the target, B-17 crews pressed forward. Their guns kept burning the enemy out of the sky. Approaching the bomb run began the most critical defensive period. Now, B-17 crews divided into smaller groups, sacrificing their mutual defensive firepower to bomb the target most efficiently. The crucial moment, the moment around which the entire mission revolved, was now in the steady hands of the bombardiers. Each bomber was now committed no more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. It didn't matter. B-17 crews had a job to do on Schweinfurt. B-17 crews had 400 tons of high explosive to deliver, and they would get the job done. The United States government, or Uncle Sam, uh, gave us a brand new airplane filled it up with gas, gave us a pilot that went through months of training and a co-pilot to help him, and then gave us a navigator to bring us to the target, gave us four or five gunners to protect us, just so we, the bombardier,
could put that bomb on the target. So we had a chauffeur, we had protection, we had everything in the world for us to get there and put the bomb on target. That's the way I felt about being a bombardier. After getting 80 hits on the two main ball bearing plants, the B-17 crews could defend themselves again, at least to the extent of evasive action against fighter attack. The main idea now was to get back to England fast. At the British landing field, word of the sky battle was out. Red flares were expected. That meant wounded aboard. These planes had priority in landing. Many of the fortresses themselves were crippled. A few came in with feathered props or with knocked out landing gear. The anniversary battle lost more men and aircraft in a single day than the 8th Bomber Command had lost in their first six months of operations in Europe. B-17 crews, who carried the war 500 miles to the enemy's industrial heart, knew better than anyone how expensive it was. It was, quite possibly, the most terrible single air battle of the war. Before it was all over, 60 bombers were shot down or lost. 40 were heavily damaged and had to be scrapped. 200 were battle damaged. Over 1,000 American airmen were killed, lost, or wounded. The mission was accomplished and the Luftwaffe could not stop the attack. But the costs were too high and nearly ended the theory of daylight raids. The concept of self-defending formations of fortresses was laid to rest. B-17 crews had to wait for the introduction of long-range fighters to cover the attacks. The flying fortress, as powerful a weapon as it was, could not do it alone. From this point on, the B-17 would be joined by long-range fighters like the P-51 Mustang. Together, they would own the air over Nazi Germany, and B-17 crews would really give them hell. The cost was high, but so was the reward. With air supremacy in hand, the Allied commanders could finally look forward to the land invasion of Fortress Europe. One quote, just to pick one out of many, uh, shortly after the invasion of Normandy in 1944, Dwight Eisenhower met with his son John. John was a newly minted second lieutenant having graduated from West Point, and they were touring the front line behind the invasion area in France in late June of 1944. And John Eisenhower said to his father, without air superiority, you would not be 